get started and hopefully people will show up or uh, anybody that shows up will just be able to catch up. I don't, I don't anticipate that I'm going to talk over anybody's head with anything. I'm not uh, d going to delve into the internals of symphony and I'm not going to uh, discuss headless Drupal. Um, so, but I'm going to talk uh, kind of about uh, company structure and culture and kind of how we leverage those things in order to be able to grow our business and uh, do the things that we do. Um, so like the you know, requisite slide about us, like obviously uh, like uh, I work for Achieve Internet. Um, we're a web development firm like most people here, um, specializing in, in Drupal stuff. Uh, we do a whole variety of different things. Um, uh, obviously, mostly Drupal specific. There's a, a handful of other things that we've done over the years, but predominantly in that arena, we have offices both in LA and in San Diego. Um, and we work across the board and lots of different stuff. Um, my name is Bill. Um, I'm the CTO at Achieve. I've been the CTO at Achieve for the last um, six years or so. Um, I manage the entire development staff um, and the technical side of uh, what we do. I come from a software background. Uh, I was a comp sci major as an undergrad, so I went and got a CS degree before I started um, trying to find something to do for work, and I just fell into both Drupal and web development. Um, and then I, I had to learn how to run a business uh, because I was the CTO. I was uh, working with our CEO, who's just walking in the door at the same time, like I was announcing him, um, uh, in order to try and figure out how to build a business and run a business. Um, so I learned a lot on the job about things. Um, I struggled a lot in terms of nomenclature because I'm not from a business background. Um, so I'm currently going back and getting an MBA. Like, so I'm, tr I'm learning a little bit more about either why some of the things that I've done have actually been effective or like how the decisions we make actually impact them. Um, and so I'll try and walk through some of that stuff. So um, the first portion of, of this is basically if you are going to run an effective pretty much anything, um, it all starts with vision. And I don't know that well, so the, the concept that, of the importance of vision, it, you know, is everywhere. Uh, I chose a Proverbs quote for it, um, but the, you could have taken it from a million different places. Um, but where there's no vision, the people perish. I mean, you, your developers are going to leave, your uh, business will dry up, things will fall apart if you can't figure out where you're trying to get to. Um, so uh, in terms of vision, I'm not even as as specifically as like needing to know 100% where you're going long term. Um, but with respect to building an engineering team, you have to at the very least understand who you want to be. Um, and I didn't really understand that I was doing this when I first started. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to decide, you know, the traits that you're going to embody, what's important to you and developers, like in an engineering team or in a business. Um, and for me, a lot of that came back to trying to build a business um, that I wanted to work for. Um, so I was trying to say, you know, I want to build really high quality products. I want to focus on quality engineering because that's what I want to do. I believe in building a good product a lot more than I believe in building something that I can, you know, just, uh, you know, do really shoddy and then hand over to somebody else um, and move on to the next project. So because that was something that was important to me, um, my hiring strategy skewed strongly towards that. Um, and it, again, at the time, it wasn't like a mental choice. Like I hadn't said um, 100% like this is exactly what I need, but I knew that I wanted quality. And so I started searching out um, and looking for people that embodied that trait. And so over the years, it's become much clearer to me and much easier for me to say, okay, I want to go find a developer that does this and thinks this way. Because the way they think is far more important than where their skills from a competency perspective are today. I can teach them the skills if the mentality is right, but I can't teach them the men mentality. I can't change human nature. I can't make something out of somebody that they aren't to begin with. Which... Uh, brings me to people. So, um, has anybody in, this, in here read Good to Great? Okay, so this is one of my, my absolute favorite business books. Um, and this is one of his, like, sort of first concepts. But he says, get the right people on the bus, the wrong people off the bus, and the right people in the right seats. So, 
there are a lot of different aspects that, that kind of go into this. Um, but we're, you know, most of us anyway are, are in services businesses and we're building Drupal sites. We're trying to turn things around. Um, but regardless of the business that you're in, um, it's really important that you're devoting your energy in the right way. Um, there are a lot of stats out there in terms of like how good developers or like good engineers impact your business versus bad engineers. Uh, but it's something like, you know, a good engineer is 10 times more effective than a, a bad engineer. And, you know, you'll waste a significantly higher percentage of time on a bad developer than a good developer. Like all these different things that basically turn into, if you start making bad hiring choices, those hiring choices have huge implications on absolutely everything in your business. Like they can sour culture, they can very easily uh, sort of turn around and, and cause you headaches. Um, I'm not going to pretend like I've hired right all the time because I most definitely have not. Um, and all the guys on my team can laugh because they've seen some of the people I've hired. Uh, but like, but you are looking for certain traits and you think that you've found people that kind of embody these traits. And when you hire them, you have to be able to coach them into making that happen, um, like what you're looking for. And if you can't do that, you are either going to expend a ton of energy trying to force them into doing something that's not natural to them, or you've just got to learn that, you know, not everybody's the right fit. Like, and so, um, you know, we have, have a bunch of process stuff that I'll talk about in a sec, but like, basically we try and make it really clear and say, Hey, you know, here are the 50 things, hundred things that we anticipate that you should be doing and how you should be doing them. Um, to make this all happen. But like, if you don't hold up that end of the bargain, then we're going to have to have a talk. Um, you know, the, the presenter that was just in here was asking me uh, how we run, run timekeeping or like how we uh, monitor remote employees. And he was wondering if I, I enforce super strict hours for people that are remote. And the answer is no. But I don't do that because my expectation is that I can monitor them from a ticket perspective and that if I give them tasks and things to work on, that they're going to get those things done. On the flip side, if they don't do those things, well, well, that's my, my contract with them is that they're going to get that done. Um, and if they can't do that portion of it, then I'm going to have to turn around and start monitoring something else more strictly, which goes into this whole concept that I'm now going to sync a lot more time and energy into managing a bad employee and trying to train a bad employee to be a good employee when it's going to be difficult to make them be that than spending time with a good employee to make them even better or give them a new skill that they could employ and, and move things forward. Just a quick question. How much time do you give people before you take them off the bus? Okay. Uh, um, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. so, so the question is, how, how much time do I give people before I kick them off the bus? And, uh, and it really varies. Like, uh, you know, I, you know I, I'm a human being just like everybody else. So I want to give people chances. Like, I don't, I, I know that, you know, people have lives and responsibilities and things. So I'm, uh, I feel for people, like, when I hire them and I want them to be successful. Um, but I'm also, uh, I, I can also move rapidly if I recognize that it's not right. So a couple examples of trying to be really stringent with this, right? Uh, so prior to even hiring somebody, uh, if I get resumes and I can, and code samples, and I can tell from resumes and code samples that they just, they lack the fundamental things that I think are going to make them successful. Um, I won't, I won't even bother getting on a phone call to talk with them because it's just not a, a valuable use of our time. Like, and if somebody pursues it and keeps pushing it, will I talk to them? Yes. Yeah, like I want to give people a fair shake, but most of the time I can review a code sample and know whether somebody it, has attention to detail and can, and, and can hack it or not. And if they don't, then it's not worth you know, wasting time. I hired a freelancer. And I brought, uh, I brought her on for a very short period of time. Like I hired her on like a, a Friday. Um, she worked for me on Friday and we, we sent things back and forth. And by like the end of the day, Tuesday, I was 
shaking her hand and telling her thank you, but it, her services would no longer be required. Um, and some people would say, well, that, that's really too fast. Like you didn't give her a fair opportunity to move forward, etc. cetera. Um, and you know, and maybe it's right. Maybe I, I was wrong, but at the same time, there were enough issues like, and I could see it, that there was no reason for me to hold back and, and try and fight something that wasn't gonna work. Like we valued different things. Like she wanted to do one, things one way and I wanted to do things a different way. And if we, we don't mesh, there, there are plenty of people doing Drupal stuff. Like everybody can have their niche and their place to go. Like it doesn't have to be my way, but if you're going to work on my team, it's got to be like that, that way. Because, <laughs> because otherwise we're not moving in the right direction. Like, you know, we're on different buses. Like we're trying to go different places. Like that's just not, it's never going to get us where we want to go. I need everybody rowing in the same direction. So um, when people aren't that, aren't effective in that way, um, uh, you know, it can be pretty rapid. Within, if I hire somebody full time, it's obviously far less rapid than three days. Like I've given them some more time because I've invested more time in, in vetting them. I've invested more time in, in getting them to come on board, and I want to give them opportunities. And you know, a, a contractor I can I can cut on one day and say, hey, we're moving on. An internal employee, I want to to give them warnings. I want to show them what they're doing wrong and try and get them to correct those things. But again, once I'm starting to write people up, I'm now wasting time doing write-ups and like all sorts of legal things that you should be doing in order to let an employee go, et cetera. This is just a waste of your time. Like we all could be working on, you know, building the next great whatever. And instead I'm wasting my time writing up an employee for poor performance because they didn't listen to me for whatever reason, stuff like that. So um, the other part is like, you know, we, once I've, now that I, you know, I hopefully have assembled a whole bunch of people that have kind of a like mindset in terms of like wanting to focus on quality and build really cool and interesting and good things, um, and I know they have the capability to do that, we can change what we're doing. So a, a good example is choosing like a vertical to focus on. Like if you are marching down a road and you think, hey, uh, media and entertainment is just going to be my bread and butter. I think I'm awesome in this, but you get a great opportunity to work in another arena or, you know, God forbid, another technology. Somebody says, you know, throws a Ruby opportunity in your lap and you've been doing nothing but Drupal. Smart people are going to figure out how to make that change because smart people, the right people want to be successful and they can all change direction and go after something new. Like I've assembled, like my dev team is our, basically all guys with really strong computer science backgrounds. So they're not like guys that are just trying to figure it out or like weekend hackers that kind of have started to pick up Drupal. They're guys that are engineers that happen to be in the Drupal space. What that gives me the freedom to do is say, okay, well, you know, we have a C-sharp opportunity. All right, well, does C-sharp make sense for our overall like growth plan as a company? Yes, it does. All right. Those smart people can pivot and they can learn something new. They can move in a new direction. They can come up with great ideas. And these guys, you know, that are in the room, they, they come up with great ideas all the time that change the exact direction that we're moving in as a company. And, you know, if I, I hire just a bunch of code monkeys or people that don't really know exactly what they're doing or just aren't, you know, aren't as sharp or don't care as much about the vision we have, then at the end of the day, they're, they're not going to change with me. They're not going to follow a new a new direction, they're not going to be able to pivot or help me pivot. Um, and, you know, kind of like the, the last side of it is, you know, life's just too short to work with people you don't like. Um, I mean, like, it is, as sad as it is, like, I don't want to go to work every day and stress. Um, it's just not fun. I, I, I do a lot of different stuff with the dev team, and I'm a busy guy. Like, I'm you know, I'm, I said earlier on, I'm going back and getting my MBA right now. I'm two years through a two and a half year program, working in the evenings to do that. I work full time at the company, like moving things forward. I'm here on weekends doing stuff on the, on the weekends. I'm married. I've got two small children, like both under four years old. Like, I mean, there's a lot going on in my life. The last thing I need is to go to work and hate being there. Like, so I, I value culture a lot when it comes to hiring people and putting the right people on the bus. Like if you, if I can't mesh with you from a personality perspective, then we're just going to clash on a regular basis. doesn't mean I want all yes men. It doesn't mean I want people to agree with me all the time. 
Um, and most of the time, these guys don't always agree with me. Um, but, but I want people that I can have an honest and like meaningful d- disagreement with without being like, that guy's an idiot. I don't ever want to talk to him again. Like, it's important that you're able to like maintain a level of discourse and be able to do things other than, you know, sit in an office together as well. So we go to lunches together or like we, run the bay together. A couple of us run a half marathon together. Like we do outside activities and things to make sure that not just because we have to, or somebody told us we needed to, but because we actually enjoy one another's company. And a lot of that goes to just assembling a team that, excuse me, that you enjoy working with because it's important to being able to move things forward. So, once you've, when, so, you know, first you, you have to have a vision of like what you want to be. Um, then you've got to hire people that kind of fit into that vision. Um, and then uh, you, you have to build processes to help people, um, you know, execute on that vision. Um, so Peter Drucker is a, is a pretty well-known management uh, sort of guru. He's got a book called The Essential Drucker, which is basically just a compilation of like 10 billion other books that he wrote that have meaningful information. But he said, management's about human beings. Its task is to make people capable of joint performance, to make their strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant. Um, so we have, we spend a lot of time on process. Um, they're kind of Two different things that you can focus on in a business. One is creativity, um, and so you can open opportunities to be creative, and uh, Google's 20% time would be a pretty good example of ways to uh, foster creativity and come up with new ideas. Um, And the alternative side is to focus on the effectiveness or your execution. Um, You know, we, we try and do things that give us the opportunity to be creative, but our emphasis is very much on effectiveness or um, our ability to produce at a high level. So we have a lot of processes that are built to try and make that execution as seamless as possible and allow us to go through um, and repeat what we're doing. So um, I, I, have, there, I have a lot of different process components. Uh, I'll try and talk a little bit about them at a high level here, and then I'll talk about some of the specifics. And if people want to know more, you can either ask a question or, or we can talk about it more later. Um, but the first part is, is planning, um, you know, the failure to plan is, is planning to fail, right? Like at the end of the day, you've got to have a plan for how you're going to get from here to there. So every one of our projects starts off by, uh, by planning through what we're going to do to make that happen. doesn't mean everything's set in stone. We are an agile shop, so we, we can move some, but we need to know at least in general, what is the scope of our overall project? And how are we getting from where we are today to where we need to be three months from now? So we do IA work, which Jeff does over here, like for us predominantly. Um, we will help somebody figure out what needs to happen. We don't do any design work, so we farm out most of the design stuff that we, we do. Um, and then once we finish doing IA, we also have like a rigorous architecture plan that we put together where we figure out all the integration points, all of like the deep dive sort of stuff. We figure out, you know, what are their performance goals on the site and how are we going to do it? What sort of security things do we need to pay attention to? Like, are, are there certain as like restrictions to access that are super valuable? And we try and outline everything that you could possibly think of in a giant document. So we have a point of reference um, that anybody can flip back to and say, hey, this is where we started. This was what we were trying to accomplish. We take all that big plan that we've developed and we toss it all into JIRA so that we can actually track the whole thing. It gets split up into sprints so that we have a sprint plan for the whole thing and and resources get assigned to the project. (coughs) And then we... uh, run the project from that point forward, basically through JIRA as a means of communication within the team. And we have, you know, again, I was talking about quality being like one of our really big sticking points, like as an engineering team. And so to ensure that we build processes that support that, that vision and help those, the people on the team um, embody that trait. So we have a very like 
sort of stringent code review process that things go through. And we expect our leads to be able to push back and make sure that people are doing the things that they're supposed to do, et cetera, so that at the end of the day, like one, people are learning how to get better. So we're training the people that don't know all of the, the ins and outs. And so that at the end, what the clients see is when we're finished with the project is the quality product that they were anticipating getting. So the, the process is there, but the process is there to support the, the values that we want to embody as a team. Uh, we work the whole thing, we do all of our work, we follow this process to get through it, we figure out how to report everything that we did, like we, we create charts along the way that show us how we're doing, etc. at least in an idealized world. You know, occasionally we get a little off on that. Um, and then the goal is to go back and, and review, you know, where we misstepped, etc. Um, so, like Jeff is having is already set up a, a meeting for us to review how we misstepped on on certain things or how we can do things better, um, so that the next time around our, our deliverable is more quality than our deliverable was this time, or our execution, if it was not as on you know point as we wanted our execution to be, next time around it will be like on point. Um, so that gives us the opportunity to communicate with the client, tell them where we're at, make sure that everything's being effective, et cetera. So once you, you're marching down the road and you've, got, you've figured out what you want to do, you've figured out who you want to do it with, um, and you figured out how you're going to kind of manage the process, um, sort of the last part of it for me, um, or the really big part of it, is, called, is focus. Um, so I, I stole this quote from a guy uh, named Robert Siegel, who works at, who's a partner at Exceed Capital, uh, and he said, one of the most useful tools a person has is the power to say no to things that are taking up time but are not adding much value to one's life. Um, has anybody ever taken a project and then looked back and said, wow, I wish I hadn't done that one? <laughs> like, no, nobody? Just me? <laughs> um, <No>. so, <laughs> so this happens on a regular basis, and... You know, I'm not going to name off exact names of projects, but there have been times where there's been at least one really big project I can think about where before we even started the project, I looked at it and said, this is going to be a problem. Like, I know today this is probably not a good idea. But we made a decision to go for through with it anyway. Like... And it happens. Like, I'm positive that other people, that I'm not the only person that has known a project was probably not going to work out, but you did it for whatever reason. You needed the, the cash flow or, you know, it was a good name or whatever it may be. But that project for us became a nightmare, right? Because at the end of the day, all the things that we thought were going to be problems with that project were problems with that project. Now, the hardest thing that anybody running a business is going to do is say no to something that's going to make them money, at least in the short term. Right? And it's hard to know for sure that you're going to lose money, but you know that you're at least going to get some revenue by saying yes to a project that comes in. So, uh, you know, an example of how we could really do this super poorly here in the near future, hopefully we won't, Ron's not watching, so maybe I mean, you never know, but... Uh, so, but like, you know, we have a, have particular focuses, like areas of, of expertise or areas that we want to work on. Like we have certain things that we're good at and that like we've shown expertise in. If tomorrow a Ruby opportunity dropped in our lap, you know, like I said, our guys are smart enough and have enough background and expertise to be able to pivot to work on a Ruby project. But just because we can work on a Ruby project doesn't mean we should work on a Ruby project. Those are two very different things. And we have to be able to recognize that sometimes saying no is actually for the betterment of our business. Like, if I take away, if I take that Ruby opportunity, what am I not doing as a result of taking that opportunity? And this concept of saying no, it goes across all sorts of different areas. Like, you know, I put some of them on the board, but like, you know, saying no, it goes for people just as much as it does for projects. You know, like I was talking about before, looking at resumes. Like, when I look at a resume, 
if it's a no, I shouldn't say yes just because it'd be useful for me to have another body on my staff right now. I, I can, and you know, in honesty, I have like before because I've made the mistake before, but that's why I say it's a really bad idea because I've walked that route and I know that it doesn't work out for me. Like you have to be able to look at a bad opportunity and say, no, I'm not going to do it. Yes, there's pressure for X, Y, Z reason, but I'm still going to say no and I'm going to work to find a solution that actually fits my problem. Um, so I, again, I'll, I'll avoid using project names to keep from making myself feel sad. But like um, we had one of the very first projects that actually pushed us forward and kind of propelled us as a company also ended up in a lot of things that, that hurt us on the backside. Um, and it hurt us for, you know, a lot uh, for predominantly like our hiring practices, like, right? cause we just didn't know any better. So, <clears throat> you know, earlier on I said, you gotta put the right people on the bus. Well, we didn't know who the right people were on the bus at that point in time. So we hired anybody that wanted to be on the bus. So we put all sorts of people on the bus and, you know, we were riding along with all sorts of different individuals. And the problem was none of them necessarily embodied the same traits or some of them even any traits, like they were just people like, and most of them definitely didn't embody the traits that we needed to be really good Drupal developers. So that was a huge struggle. So we ended up in a position where we're rather than being honest with the client rather than saying, hey, we're going to have to delay X, Y, Z, rather than being patient and, fought and saying no to a bunch of developers that didn't fit what we were looking for and really holding back and trying to, <coughs> trying to find the people that did like fit what we were looking for. We put them all on the bus. We started on the project. We assumed that they were just going to sort of work out. We didn't have any processes in place to make sure that it worked out. So they all got off the rails in all sorts of different ways and means. And then, you know, three months down the road, we're looking at each other like, how could this possibly have fallen apart so bad? I have no idea. Like, this is very strange. Um, we did very, we did a project plan. And when the client changed it, we didn't rework our project plan. We didn't come up with new thoughts. So we, we built this huge number of, obvious missteps in retrospect that at the time we were just too either young or naive or like too uh, green in this whole process to know that we were going in the wrong direction. Um, so the short version is like, you know, it's really important that you figure out, you know, where you're going to go <laughs> like long term so that you hire the right people. But then it's important that you're able to say no these people don't fit that vision. And just because they don't fit that vision, there's no reason for me to put them on my staff or try and train them or try and make them they, they aren't. They either are somebody that's going to follow this vision and walk in this path, or they're not somebody that's going to do that. I say no to the ones that don't fit. I say yes to the ones that do. And then I build processes in place to try and help keep them all on the rails. Like, you know, here are all the things that you need to do in order for everybody to work effectively, in order for us to, as a company, maintain this, uh, this overall ethos of delivering a quality product. And then, you know, we focus back in over and over again on is what we're doing actually leading to the end that we want to do. So that becomes saying no to developers or no to projects that are going to distract us from it. Um, one more like sort of short story on it. There's a, a guy that, that came and talked to my class that was building a company doing uh, boat tracking like software. And he had both a services business and a product business like all mashed up into one. So he built the product business kind of out of the services business. Um, but he said that to me that his biggest struggle is trying to figure out how to allocate his resources because it's really easy when people call him and say, hey, I'm a really big company. I want you to work on services for me at $150 an hour. Can you do this giant project? And he wants to jump at it because there's a whole bunch of short-term money there that he can reap by doing all that services work. At the same time, if he does that, then his product languishes and people aren't pushing for the product. It's not becoming what it could be. And he's missing this opportunity to either sell that product, do something meaningful with that product, etc. So the big goal for him was figuring out how to say no 
Just because their services work there and you can make some money in the short term didn't mean that saying yes was going to be his best option. And so he had to learn the really tough lesson of saying yes too many times and watching his product struggle that once he started saying no, his product could thrive and that was best for his company overall. And that helped him move forward. Um, so that's kind of... I got a quick question. Yeah, so I mean, I don't... <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, how much of that do you think is, is more of a resource management problem? Like, I, I always, I always hate turning away projects that you know you can do, but they're, but in the end, if you could get the customer to say, okay, that really aggressive timeline that's a month and a half long, which is probably like way too aggressive to begin with, um, you know, how much of that could you say, okay, well, if I could make that six months, we could do this the right way, and you could allocate it, like. Yeah, so the, there's always a, a natural tension, right? Like there's so there's a lot there's a lot in all of this that's like making decisions. So one thing I, I should mention too is like what I'm saying about like focusing on quality and like building all this stuff. Like that's what we're about. Like that's what we want to build. It, like. At achieve and again that's more of a reflection of what I want us to be as an engineering team than it is what somebody else should be following there's a lot of money to be made in building really simplistic really pretty like front-end websites and not building any engineering at all um, but it's just not what I want to do it's not what I find interesting so I want to solve or build something more interesting than that so when it comes to like deciding you know, in terms of resourcing, yes, it's a resource. It could be a resourcing problem, but his point was that if the timeline was fixed and he couldn't like get the client to change it at all, the smartest thing he could do was learn to say, "No, I'm not going to take that opportunity because I'm going to ha- I'm making trade-offs. I'm taking people away from a product that I know could be successful if I devoted time to it, and instead, I'm devoting time and energy towards services business that is." $150 an hour right now, and then it's gone tomorrow. Um, and that's just not the best use of his time. Make sense? But if, of course, if you can change timelines, et cetera, that's the healthy discussions you ought to be having, right? Because you don't want to give that business away if you can afford it, but it's being a realist with the client. Like if you, you know, if being honest with people is, is part of your value system, like, which hopefully, like most people in the room agree with that, um, like you ought to be able to say, hey, look, I I can't effectively do your project on this timeline. Like, if you could do it at six months, I would more than love to take on your project. It would be amazing, but it needs to work on that timeline because if it doesn't work on that timeline, it's not going to work out for me, and it's not I'm not going to get you what you deserve like in that period of time. So, yeah, so it's like a matter of setting your boundaries. If you have any like you know tips around <coughs> like defining what your boundaries are? I mean, outside of like you know what you know, your developer can be, you know, things like that. Is there anything that you, any gotchas that you picked up along the way throughout as far as, like, learning what those boundaries are? Yeah, well, so, a couple of things. Like, so, so one part of it is, like, you know, so, uh, Greg just walked out, but, like, I watched a presentation from Greg, I don't know, maybe a year ago, maybe two years ago, something like that, and one of the things that he, he said was really interesting as he was talking about uh, figuring out what your niche is like in the world um, and if you can figure out what you're good at and like kind of what you you tackle um, that helps you make decisions right just the same as having a, a value and being able to recognize what you truly value in terms of engineering staff helps me hire the right people so the the first boundary just becomes like does this fit whatever I'm doing like if it fits what you're doing then that makes it, then that's the, like sort of the, the first hurdle that you need to get past. Uh, once you figure out, yes, okay, this works for me, it fits within what I want to do, um, then it's like, can I do it? And can I do it comes down to a little bit more of a, a mental game on your plate, on your part, or like, a, I don't know, how much of an emo- emotional roller coaster you're willing to take. As an example, right, we had a project not that long ago where it's like, okay, we have the opportunity to either take this project and you're going to have to go out and spend a lot of time trying to recruit and figure out people that fit on the bus that like are the right people 
um, you're going to have to go out and find like three of them in the next month. Like, and if you can't find three people like to help this process along, then we're either going to have to turn down the project or we're going to have to go back to, we're going to have to take it on and then go back to the client with bad news. And we don't want it, either of those two scenarios. So our goal was to say, okay, like, do I think that I can go out and I can find the people to make this happen? And so we evaluated and we tried to decide whether that would happen or not. And I thought, okay, I think we have, we know enough people and we have enough connections that I can find three people that I can put on an, on a contracting basis in order to, to solve this, this resourcing crunch. And so that's what we did is we said, okay, let's do it. If we win it, I'm going to go out and I'm going to hit the streets and I'm going to go talk to people and I'm going to make this happen. And so it, the project hit, I went out and, and hit the streets. I used all the resources and the people I knew, and we found, you know, four or five resources that could fit the mold of the people we wanted. We brought them on and, you know, the projects moved forward the way that they wanted to. But, you know, it comes a little bit to, to your risk tolerance, right? Because you're making a promise on something that doesn't exist yet when you're doing some of that. And it's how confident do you feel? You know, I'm, you know, for better or worse, some, I, I fluctuate between absolutely no confidence and then, you know, being overconfident. So uh, sometimes when somebody throws a challenge in front of me, I'm like, no, I'm going to figure this out. Let's do this. Like, I don't want to be the bottleneck in my company. Um, for a long time, like sales was a, a like weakness, like we, we struggled to, to bring in either enough leads or to be able to sell enough projects to keep us busy. Um, and we finally like got to a point recently where it's like, well, sales is doing their job. Like, am I going to step up to the plate and I'm going to do my job, like to be able to handle the work that they're throwing at me? And I said, I, you know, I'm going to go figure this out. Like you did your job. Now it's my time. Now it's my time to go do my job. I'll go figure this out. Let's, let's go. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, you also have strategic concerns. <coughs> so you have to ask yourself strategically, does this make sense as well as well? And you also have to understand the client, that the, the potential client that you're working with. Some of them have a completely mismatched understanding and expectation, and you can't easily always convince them otherwise. Yeah, so I'm looking pretty things. good at kicking the client right now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And the challenge is when they find a website that says someone's own promise to do this for five dollars, and yeah. I can get a logo for five dollars, yeah. I can get this for five dollars. They're like, what? Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, and you know, we're, you know, I probably shouldn't say this because I haven't even talked to Jenny about it. But like, one of the things that we're talking about is like, how do we how do we better identify how our our leads that come in or the projects that we're going to get how do they fit into this model? Like, how do we know like what is a good lead like versus a bad lead like and how do we like somewhat objectively identify that and if we can create some sort of mildly objective metrics like I mean as simple as like you know yes this is in a vertical we want to work in or no it's not in a vertical that we want to work in at least then we can say hey you know from a strategic perspective this is something that we should pursue for XYZ reason it gives us something to match with. <coughs> Every organization, I mean, we, we do this in ours. Um, we, we have metrics around our clients, and we have like risk metrics. We look at a client, we say, they have a Drupal listing house, they don't have a Drupal listing house. They've yep. had historical Drupal projects, they don't have historical Drupal projects. Um, you know, they have a design, you know, we, we have some, somewhat of a 21 point checklist, if you will. Yep. And that's really huge to me because it does, it comes from the sales side, and I look at that and I go, this is going to be a complete shitstorm for the next six months of my life, or <laughs> this is going to be, you know, awesome. We're going to do something really cool. Yeah, for um, sure. Yeah, I, I think um, this has been great. Uh, I, I deal with a lot of teams, so I deal with a lot of different clients, and I work with a lot of teams, and then lately I've been helping build teams, so helping organizations find and build. I'm, I'm really interested in, in, you know, kind of continuing the conversation around, um, you know, just going back to resource management. I know we all have, like, you know, we all probably run some kind of project manager and we kind of swag our, our um, you know, our, our, our development. Um, and do you find that planning process more encumbering, like, when you're, when you're doing resource planning? You, is there any tips or tricks around that that you, that you can maybe provide? Because I find myself right now, I'm just burning so much working with people teaching them how to plan sprints and work on sprints and how to, you know, 
trying to figure out how much resources are going to be used. Yeah. And I, I don't necessarily have too much experience in that, but I'm like getting dragged into that because I'm the technical architect. Okay, so, where are you at? Uh, I work in Oakland. No, no, what city? Uh, in Orange County. Okay, so um, we're going to have SoCal Code Camp coming up uh, probably sometime in October. We can have a little uh, weekend, Saturday, Sunday. We're going to have a lot of great Agile Scrum stuff. Awesome. I recommend you bring your team to that. We just had it in San Diego like two months ago at UCSB. Yeah, another great thing where all the developers come in, just like here, right. except we're young and Drupal. Right. And I'm trying to create more open source talks because it started as like .NET. Right. And all that kind of stuff. So do check that out. Okay. Um, we'll put consultants to help you with the agile stuff. We'll come into your house on Zoom stuff. If you're not an expert at it, it's really hard. You know, even if you feel you've read all the books, it's really hard to feel comfortable doing it unless someone kind of hold your hands and say, "Okay, this is it." Because a lot of people think. Oh, I'm doing agile, but they're they're screwing up on a few areas that could really get more efficient. And this is SoCal Code Camp. Yeah, SoCal Code Camp. Right now, they probably have the San Diego version up. And you know, it's like once they get this stuff organized, they'll, they'll be uh, on the at U.S. at uh, U.S. Uh, University of Southern California. So yeah, so it's like you know, summer. It's at UCSD, so it's great for you guys. <laughs> That's where I'm going to school. So. It's, it's a little yeah. down there. Uh, UCSD is it's a great school, but God, I don't know why they got rid of the beer on campus. Ask, ask, ask to, to go to the Rady School. Um, that, like, that's where I'm going. Like, they have a nice auditorium. They have beer right up the hill. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, we used to have beer every Friday there. You know? um, fun, 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 fun games. So actually, it would be kind of cool for you guys to grab your team if you want to get the Agile stuff. And we talked a lot about team building there and, and how to make things more efficient. So when you look at it, the big question about like, the talent is, how do you pull the talent in and keep them there? Because in the end, it's like, you know, you go to all these meetups and you see different places. I see places that are like, hey, here's a coffee, and, and you're like, you know, the caffeinated, you know, thing that will keep you away. And here's the fresh fruits and whatnot. And then I go to other places where, like, it's going to cost me to get coffee, right? And after a while, like, you know, I've been to a place, and this kills me. I've been to a place where they had Indians, you know, who had the ring from overseas with a 17 inch CRT. What the hell? You give me. 300 bucks, and I will at least increase his you know, performance by 1% by putting in two 24 inch monitors on, on there. And yeah, I'm going to ROI every week, right? When you walk in there as a developer, you ask, Do I want to work there? Right. You ask yourself, Do I want to work there? Right. And if they're not giving you the basic tools that will increase your productivity, at least, you know, yeah. no, environment, environment no. morale are, are huge. I mean, I work with a pretty progressive engineering team, and I try to copy and clone a lot of what I see they're doing and translate that into some of my client relationships. But um, yeah, I think uh, I'd, I'd love to do that. I'd love to kind of pick up more on the formal agile. I guess I've been doing agile my whole life. I just really didn't know that that's what I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I've never been by the book anyways. So. Well, I, most people aren't able to buy the book in Agile. Like, you know, everybody runs it, and they run like some sort of variant of it that works out well for their organization. I mean, one thing I would say is like, for us, one of the easiest things to do is like throw them into a team that actually works first. So like, even when we try and hire leads and bring people on at the top level, we don't just say, okay, great, here's the process, go run it. Like, it's here, go work with Sean, and you'll be on Sean's team. Let Sean show you the ropes of like how he organizes the process. And then you'll take on like that same organization on your own, so that now you know how it works. Do you guys work with outside uh, outsourcing, like nearshore or offshore teams at all in your own company? And how do you manage and enforce standards and delivery? So we we don't work with like any offshore teams unless you consider like the fact that I have a couple of Costa Ricans that work for me that are moving back to Costa Rica. Um, so <laughs> like, but they're both on like full time staff. There's like, big teams usually. So, yeah, um, so like, so the way that we do it though, um, and you know, lots of people have different ways to go about it, but the way that we manage it is they follow the same process that we do. So, uh, we, we estimate out like from a, a project plan perspective, how much something's supposed to be, we get them to buy off on whatever our estimate is. They tell us what they think it's going to be, but, uh, we figure out what it is. We have them put in all their work on a daily basis so we can see how they're doing from a time perspective, not necessarily a code perspective, but a time perspective. And then when it comes time to finish that like segment, that story of work that they're doing, we go back through and we do a code review on it so that we audit everything that they're doing. 
Um, so in the example I gave earlier with somebody that wasn't working out, um, in that three-day span, I had two like large code audits on stuff that was being produced, and I could see in the first code audit, things weren't being done the way that I wanted, showed all my concerns, like, hey, here's all the stuff that needs to get fixed if you want to keep moving forward. A day and a half later, second code audit, hey, none of this stuff's actually improving at all. In fact, in certain respects, we're going further away. Hey, this isn't going to work out. With, the other, with other people, especially ones that produce at a higher level, hey, here are a few things to tweak, et cetera. This looks good. Great. Like, make those changes. Let me know, and then I'll merge that code in. Um, so they all stay isolated in their own branches, working on their own stuff. But as soon as they're, they're done, I can audit that code, or whoever's the lead on the project can audit the code, review it, say, yes, that's good. No, it's not, and then merge it in. And if it's not, then they're having discussions with the developers. And then if it's not improving, then they're having discussions with me. And then that's when we're intervening and, and changing the relationship. <laughs> Terminating. <laughs> so, Phil, I have a question sort of that extends the whole thing, because at least for the duration of the project, other team members are coming from your client. And in addition to what we just talked about, sort of vetting your, your projects, there's going to be personalities there. And it's not always possible to predict whether these people will be a good fit. So at what point do you pull the plug on a project because your clients don't suffer the project? <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, some of it goes back to that, the concept of being able to say no, too, right? Yeah. Like, so um, if I'm looking at a project and it's borderline, maybe that, like, I'm not sure whether I should take it or not, and then that happens, like, maybe I'm pulling the plug pretty quickly because I just know it's not going to work. In general, like, if we're taking on a project, we... We start to start from the negative assumption that somebody that, that's internal is just not going to know what they're doing 100%, um, and that we're going to have to do a lot of work for them. So that means there's some higher costs because part of what we're doing is training. We're not just doing development. We're not just overseeing like things getting done, but we're actually training their staff and trying to turn them into Drupalists. Right? So we bake that into our expectations on everything. And then once they come on board, we put them in our exact same process and have them work through our process. And if they're succeeding, great, they're succeeding and we're moving forward and things are going well. If they're not succeeding for whatever reason, um, then it becomes a, an opportunity for us to go back and say, look, we're running you through this code repro review process, but it's taking a lot longer for us to get things done. Like Normally they have their own set of tasks, so you can see their tasks are never going down or something because they're just not getting through. They're not doing the stuff they need to do in order to do it. But we know it really early in the process in that way. And so we can go back and say, hey, guys, like your time, either your timeline's not going to work. You're going to have to pay us more money to continue to go in this, this direction because you know, we're going to have to push out the timeline and continue to do code reviews. Or, or potentially, like if it's a client that you know, we're really struggling with, you know, maybe this isn't the right project. Like, hey, maybe we should shake hands and say, you, know, you should find somebody else. That last option very, very rarely happens. Usually we can, we can come to some sort of agreement. Because again, they, you know, there are people too, they want their project to succeed. They're looking for ways to make it happen. They just want our feedback on how to make that happen. And we've had teams kick out their internal teams and like give stuff to us. We've had teams, had them take it away from other teams that were working with us and give us everything to us. And it's not our intent to like try and badmouth or cause problems or anything of that nature, but our biggest concern is the quality of their project and what they're trying to accomplish. And as long as we can convey that that's what we're after um, and it doesn't come off as like we're bad-mouthing somebody, then they're open to, to that situation. Again, they want their project to be successful. That's usually the most important thing. So they're looking for ways to remediate whatever problems they have. So in other words, you're not trying to get rid of the client. You're trying to fix it so you get the work done. Yeah. You know, so you're, you're, you're bringing up the question where what happens when you want to actually terminate that relationship? And that gets into a lot of contractual arguments. Yeah. Well, you, gotta, you gotta have those clauses in that contract so if you pull the report it's some larger and you can just audit it just to review. I know that that's, that's definitely something I've had to experience, but if you wait to the end, yeah. you're, you're never gonna win that. Uh, you, gotta, you gotta attack that early. If there's a problem, you gotta identify it the very first week and be, be on it. And that's the thing that either stops a problem from happening or allows you to get out of it at the end. Do you guys write like client like risk reports for them? Like if you know something that's like, hey, this is totally gonna put the project at risk, do you guys go through a like long process? I noticed that we've started doing that recently and it scares the shit out of me. 
<laughs> like, like somehow that's more ominous. Like, <laughs> like they will have to see us. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean we. So in for full transparency, no, we don't do anything that's like super formal. Like we actually have a, a documented process that we actually don't use at the moment um, to be able to do that and let, capture it. And we will probably do some more of that again in the future. Um, but right now it's a little bit more ad hoc. Like we identify things and we notify the clients of things. Most of our clients have, uh, our clients have pretty much, uh, like except for people that are like just, you know, kind of on a retainer client, we have a weekly check-in at very least, like where we're talking to them and trying to walk them through like anything that might be a problem. Um, so we're pretty proactive in letting them know what it is. There's little red font and there's no H1, but otherwise, like it's. Uh, oh no, I just confused. Yeah, yeah. 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 Ye
and, and aren't with all these large. Well, you have a hundred page proposal, yeah. and, and and you get into the project. There's no way it ever comes out exactly as you had planned. Even if you plan, that you know, at the end degree, it still changes a lot. That's where agile really comes yeah. in. And, but what you need to do is, is be working along and communicating, and and somebody's got to be monitoring the final the final number, right? And you know, it might be great. We all have a million dollar you know project, but. What are we getting for that million dollars? It's still somebody that has to sign off on that mm -hmm. and, and say, okay, I'm, the CEO isn't involved in the day-to-day -day operations, the person signing off, did they get a million dollars worth of work? And if, if they didn't, then no matter how, what great work you did, and no matter how much the client asked you for, you're not gonna succeed. Because if you can't deliver a million dollars worth of work, it, it doesn't matter. Or, or the perception of a million dollars. Yeah. 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 Oh, the perception of a million dollars. It's only about the perception of a hundred percent. Right. right. Uh, and, right. and I mean, not yeah. like not that I know anything about the scenario, but like sometimes too, like for us, you know, as bad as it sounds, like client can be a risk factor too, right? Like oh, yeah. we're going into a project and we we want to assess to ourselves like what is the chance that this might end up in a lawsuit or somebody's <laughs> going to be unhappy with what we did because we don't like if the the chance of lawsuit is ninety five percent, like <laughs> probably not worth it no matter what the money is involved. So like. We try and be really cognizant of like, you know, how easy is this client to deal with? Like, how realistic are they to work with us? Like, if we've had any back and forth, are they, is it just their way or the highway? Or is it like, hey, yeah, I'm willing to work with you to try and figure it out, et cetera. And you get a lot of that stuff. Like, if you really are paying attention and you care about it, like, you get a lot of that when you're, you're walking through somebody through the sales process. Like, as you walk through it and you start architecting it out, you get a sense of like how hard or how easy is this client really going to be to work with. So you start figuring out those risk factors. And there's a, a great, I think, Malcolm Gladwell like, uh, you know, quote, uh, you know, statistic that's like, you know, most doctors don't get sued because they're bad doctors. They get sued because they're not good people to work with. Like, and most of the time, like, if you stay on the up and up and you are, you know, trying keeping cool and you're talking with people, etc. you can avoid being in that category of a bad developer or like a bad engineering firm that people don't want to deal with. Like you can be somebody that they're like, okay, like they're good people. Like I, I don't want to hurt them. I mean, Ron, you know, Ron talked to, Ron worked with an engineering firm like not that long ago <laughs> that totally let him down like a, a, on an external project. And, uh, you know, Ron's not turning around and suing them for one. Um, but two, he even had trouble firing them, despite the fact that they had completely let him down, not because they were, uh, like, because, because he liked them. Like, they were nice people. So it, he, the only way he could bring himself to fire them was by, like, focusing on, this is best for them long term. Like, they need to learn this lesson. Like, it's not you, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, like, but it's really interesting, right? And again, a lot of this just comes down to human dynamics, like, understanding that, at the end of the day, like we're all people and we're all gonna react. And if somebody is not a pleasant person to deal with, like early on, they're probably not going to suddenly become a more pleasant person to deal with along the way. Like that's a risk factor and you have to pay attention to it. You need to be able to say no if it's not gonna work out. I think what I have to learn, especially in my current job <coughs> where you know I'm working in-house and my clients are my bosses, is you have to call the space. Um, it's like, okay, I'm totally willing to do that, but I need you to recognize that you just moved the goalposts. The, the spec you read on was this, and I absolutely see what you're saying, it's a good idea, and we'll do it, but yep. it will extend the time, and you'll be spending more money, you need to own that, that's your deal. My deal is I'll make it happen, but you just moved the goalposts, that's your problem. Yep. It's effective client community. Right, and, and yeah. but you know, it's, it's a very good way to say it. Doing that the, the fair. First, few, first few times you're with your boss is um, not a fun. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it builds character. Yeah. 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 Build your relationship and they trust you. Like, yeah. that's, I think that's why like, yeah. I, I sometimes like come up brash and then customers love me yeah. longer because they <laughs> <laughs> they come back and love me the longer and say no, I, I will call it spade is a spade. I'm not I'm not doing this out of personal bias. I'm not doing I'm doing this as this is how I see it. This is Based on my experience, this is what you have to be aware of, and, and I'll, I'll leave the decision to you, but right now. I, I think that's what I found effective. If, if you're realistic with them and you 
tell them all the options, then they get to choose what they want to do. And most of the time they go, oh, it's more money and more time? Oh, never mind, we'll continue on that. Yeah, or, <laughs> yeah. or, or you come to find out that like, money's, they don't really right. care. It's like, I just need this. Finish. That's the yeah. winning situation. Yeah. <laughs> if you say no to, to them all the time on everything, then all of a sudden they don't trust you. you know? right. And that trust is Or the vice versa, if you say yes to everything. Right, then it's the right. same thing too. Yeah. 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 They yeah. step yeah. over. I got one more yes. question. Okay, and then after that, we're dr we're talking over beers. So, uh. <laughs> so, so it's, it's actually it segues perfectly. Uh, so, what do you guys do like on any type of regular basis to kind of keep morale up on the team? No. So, I mean, so the the first part again, <laughs> the first part again is like it's a, a a lot of it, a lot of it's about environment, right? Like, I I'd like to think at least that I'm not super high pressure. Like, if people don't get stuff done, then it's, it matters to me. But as long as people are getting stuff done, like. It's not that big of a deal. And because we built a, a culture where everybody gets along with one another, there's not a lot of high tension in the room like dealing with stuff. Like you know that everybody's trying to pull in the same direction. So even when they don't succeed, you don't you don't turn that from failure on something into a personal attack of some sort. Um, so that helps a lot. Like beyond that, we do lots of like sort of random kind of things together. We don't all go like hang out on a weekly basis after work and go drink beers because um, you know lots of us have families or wives and things and like I said my life's pretty busy but like but we walk over and get coffee almost every morning and like hang out. We play fantasy football like as a group and compete against each other. We'll uh, go in the conference room and watch movies together sometimes. One of the guys brought in a PS4 and so like we have a PS4 to, to play. Well watch stuff on Netflix or we'll bring up YouTube videos. Like um, we get together and have have scrum like every morning. Like and we do it different than most companies and part of that this is just a small company thing for the time being. But like it gives us an we have one company scrum where everybody gets to come together. So we get to see everybody's faces. Like we get to talk to everybody and see everybody. Um, so we try and come up with as many ways like kind of in a simplistic fashion that we can spend that. We can spend time together. We can do stuff together. Like we can hang out together, etc. Um, without it being sort of on a, a super obtrusive. Like I, I told Ron this, but there, there's a guy that ran an engineering firm um, at a, a while back, and the way he said. He tried to organize everything for developers to go out and hang out, and so he set up all these after-hours activities and did all this stuff, and he'd get ten percent of people would show up. He's like, I guess they just aren't involved. They don't like it. He's like, Oh, okay, let's do something at work. And he threw an event at work, and everybody shows up. And he's like, Oh, well, it's not a matter that they don't like hanging out together. It's just that they aren't into going out after hours to hang out together. They they're doing something else. So. You have to find team building activities that work within the confines of the people that you have. And sales and or younger like people maybe having lots of after hours activities is the perfect one. Like earlier in our history as a company, that happened a lot. We'd go out and hang out and drink together after work. Um, now our, co our company's a little bit older, like everybody's a little bit more mature. And, and, uh, so, you know, we have other stuff. So it's, it's harder for us to do some of that stuff. And so we, we find different ways to do it. <laughs> but we had, in our defense, the other day we did a fantasy football draft and we went and got beer and brought beer in and we sat and we did our fantasy football draft and hung out at the fantasy football draft. And we bring in lunch. Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, and, we, and we have lunches brought in like on a regular basis and a bunch of us walk to lunch together and we go, a bunch of us will, uh, a bunch of us, three or four of us will oftentimes like, Go for a run around the bay, close to the ha uh, close to our office. So like, we do a bunch of like kind of random stuff, and then we try and organize like bigger activities when we can. From my perspective, I think it's nice that like Scrum, I know what they're doing, even though I don't understand half the time. But they get to hear what I'm doing, and uh, however I'm, like bored they might sound when I'm you know. But then also lunch and learns we do every Tuesday, and I get a chance to present, and they present, and I listen, and they listen. So how big is your company? Number of people. We're 16 full time people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, we, we have a number of them. We, do, we like having subcontractors for the up and down, but um, it, it just works out better as a small team. It always does. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I noticed uh, 
some people are doing, uh, so we have a lot of meetups here in the IRS, is a company will say, 